Do you believe? Like we just sang, do you believe? Um, how many of you enjoyed Emma Lee's song, The Reckless Song? Wow, wow. Um, I told this story in a first service back a few weeks ago. Um, it wasn't very long ago when Emma Lee struggled with something that was basically uh, almost controlling her life in some cases. And uh, God has done amazing things. We had a service here where I felt led to just have anybody who was struggling with any kind of a physical uh, affliction to come forward. I think it was, I don't know, a couple months ago maybe. And uh, t tell them what happened to you that day. Tell them what was happening before and what happened that day. Okay. So I was having um, non-epileptic seizures for about a year. Um, and like the doctors couldn't, I couldn't get medicine for it because it was an epilepsy and they didn't know really what was causing it or anything. And so um, I was struggling a lot with it, but it was December 31st and it was a Sunday service and Pastor Neil um, asked if anybody needed prayer for like physical needs. And so I came up and I had been praying like for a while for it, um, but God decided in that moment to heal me. And um, there was the, that night I had one more seizure and it was like Satan was attacking me one more time. And then I haven't had a seizure since. And yeah. <laughs> Hey, let's pray over her and for the rest of the service. God, we thank you for Emma Lee as well as so many other people in our church that are so gifted as musicians and singers. We are so blessed with such an abundant supply. But God, we thank you for her story, her testimony, God. We thank you that you are going to accomplish what you have called her to be, who have you, you have made her to be. And we're so grateful that along with so many other gifted singers. She is added to this, God, and we are so blessed. Lord, anoint her, empower her, keep her humble, Lord, and I pray that she would step out in faith, God, overcoming everything that the enemy may throw at her. And Lord, we pray for this service, Lord. We pray, God, that you would do transformational work that only you can do, that no man can do, except for, Lord, you call us to partner, and Lord, with you. And, and God, we thank you that... The gospel of Jesus Christ is what transforms lives. And I can say like Paul the Apostle said, I did not come to you with eloquency of speech, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, God, we pray that the Holy Spirit's power would, would stretch forth, God, your hand to bring about life change, encouragement, Pour out your grace for the forgiveness of sins so that people can be liberated, O oh God, so that they would not have to stay stuck in shame and guilt because you came, Lord, to set us free from guilt, from shame, from bondage, God, from affliction. God, you, have, you are our great deliverer. We pray that that would happen today, God. We don't just come expecting to just... Uh, just do something for an hour and a half or so, but God, we come expecting to meet the living God. We come expecting to encounter Christ. We come expecting, God, for you to open our hearts, God. And we, the way that we came in is not the way that we want to leave, God. We need you to move. So, God, create a hunger and create a thirst in us, God, that as the deer pants for the water, so our souls are thirsting and longing for you, God. So, God, we pray for a mighty anointing on the ears of every listening uh, person, God, and also for my voice, God. Empower me, Lord Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Ah, please turn in your Bibles. Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Today we're talking about overcoming anxiety. Overcoming anxiety. That if we have the, those fears, those anxious thoughts, those worries, nobody, nobody in the house has those issues, right? Anybody? Uh, that they would become a thing of the past and we would learn how to manage those things and to conquer those things. That's, that's what Jesus is in the business of doing. So Philippians chapter 4, please turn to verse 4 and we'll read together. Today I'm reading from the NIV. Are you ready? Really? I guess maybe the balcony people are more alive. Are you ready, balcony people? Are you ready on the floor? Okay, because whenever we crack open God's word, we have such an expectation 
of what he will do. Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord. Say the next word. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Wow, that's our first thing right there. Our first, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about four ways to overcome anxiety. Number one, rejoice, okay? Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because when you're, in an, when you're in anxiety or fear, how many of you know people aren't always very gentle? When you're panicking, when you're nervous. When, uh, let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Why, Paul? The Lord is near. That's good so far, isn't it? The Lord is near. That helps just right there. That helps. There, there's levels of help that God gives us right there. The Lord is near. Now, so we talked about re rejoice. That's the first thing. The second one is reject. That's what I'm, we're going to break down today. Reject. What do, what do I mean by reject? Do not be anxious about anything. So we're going to reject anxiety. In other words, we're going to confront it. We're not going to, we're going to confront it when it becomes a default. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with what? Thanksgiving. Present your requests to the Lord. So we've got rejoice, reject. Now we've got requests. So we've got to train our mind to do those three things. There's one more to come. Train our mind to, to do actually four things. Rejoice, reject anxiety, request. Just constantly making requests to God. And now let's, let's look at the next one. And this is what will happen. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will, say that word will. Not, he didn't say maybe or hopefully or might. He will guard your hearts and your what? In Christ Jesus. So notice, it's all relational, right? The Lord's near, you know, the Father's presence is here, and then we do all this in Christ Jesus. Now, here we go. Uh, the last one, the fourth way that we're going to train our minds is to redirect our thinking. Redirect. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure. I could do a rap with this, right? Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Please don't, Pastor. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He just gives you like a list. Because we got a lot of negative things we could give a list of. I'm worried, worried about my money. Am I going to have money as... Where are we going to have the money for mortgage, the insurance? Where are we going to have this? And, and my, my health is deteriorating. So I've got a list of things negative to think about. My car is breaking down. Am I going to lose my job? I can't stand my coworker. Do I have to deal with him every day? Um, I don't like my spouse. This is an issue. Um, there, there's so many things that I worry about. You know, uh, my children, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to them? And my grandkids, oh my goodness gracious, am I going to die? Uh, the answer is yes to that, by the way, at some point. Uh, so all these things that we, we, you know, we've got lists, don't we? But Paul is giving us a new list to think about intentionally. All right, so we'll break that down a little bit. All right, so here we go. I like this next point. This is Pastor Paul the Apostle. Uh, saying what every pastor hopes to see in his congregation, but of course, even in himself, because when we preach, we're preaching. We're all on the same level ground because we're all dealing with the same stuff. But this is, this is from a pastoral heart. Whatever you have learned, hopefully you're learning something or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. It's, can you feel his heart, his pastor's heart? Please put it into practice. Why? Because when God gives a gift of, of shepherding to a pastor or a teacher or an elder or an overseer, there's, there's a, such a strong desire to see change. And as Ed Cole used to say, change isn't changed until it's changed but we preach for change. You guys encourage each other because you believe in change. We, how many of you have experienced change from the living God? Emily was just up here telling us God changes things. 
So that's the scripture that we're going to go by. We'll add a few as we go. How many of you with me today? Good? Okay, so I've got to tell you a story. about. We're speaking about overcoming anxiety. I was on a flight this winter from Tampa to Atlanta. And then I jumped on the flight back to go from Atlanta to Tampa. And guess what airlines I used? Anybody ever hear of Spirit Airlines? How many of you have reservations about Spirit Airlines? So you, what's up with that? Because listen, I, I saved a ton of money. And when, when it came to, to uh, the decision about your seats, you can pay extra for your seats. Or you can hit the random button and just accept what you get. You ready for this? I hit random on both ways. Guess what I got? First class. Thank you, Jesus. Like Caleb says, favor isn't fair, right? So I just got first class. The very first seat, you know, whatever. I mean, first class according to Spirit Airlines, which isn't, you know what I mean. Uh, so, uh, okay, real quick. So on the way to Atlanta, I sit next to a guy that looks and talks just like Jeff Bridges. No kidding. True Grit, I love that movie. So I'm sitting next to him and we're just hitting it off and he's a, a pilot and he's, he's a really cool guy. Now the flight attendants, well, we're facing them because they're sitting facing us because we're in the front row. The whole time that we were in flight and they were watching us, they think that he really is Jeff Bridges and they think I'm his producer. So they're anticipating getting um, uh, autographs, right? So at the end, they said, I is he Jeff Bridges? And are you, are you like his, uh, are you his agent? Are you his, um, you know, whatever? What did I say? Producer. Pray for me. Anyways. Uh, and I go, absolutely. No. no, I didn't say that. I didn't lie. I didn't lie. I wish they did, though. We should have gone with it. Like, it was pretty cool. Anyways, on the way back. So that story has nothing to do with my message. On the way back. I get front row again. Now, who do I sit next to? I sit next to this 28-year-old girl. She's kind of like a really funny girl, but she's also having a panic attack because it's the first time she's flying. I'm sitting next to her, and she's, she's just way out there. She's like, hi, hi, hi my, name's, my name's Brittany, and um, yeah, so uh, it's my first time here, and um, um, I'm really scared, and I don't know what to do, and I'm like, God, why? You know, why, why did I sit there? I liked being in first class, but no, actually, I, I, I did enjoy it. So we're talking, and I'm trying to calm her down, and um, she's literally using four-letter cuss words the whole time. Now, I don't want to drop the pastor card until I really see what she's all about, so let's give this thing some, let's just let it all play out, and then if she asks me, I'll tell her, right? So it was really funny and interesting. So she's just cussing and she's scared and she's nervous. And I start out with this kind of counsel. I said, you know what, um, Brittany, I, I said, um, really the way I think about it, you know, if it, if it's my time to go and this plane crashes, you know, it's just my day. And I'm realizing, you know what, that's just not a good thing to say. This, that doesn't work. Let's, let's work on this, Pastor Neil. Let's work on this. So anyways, throughout the flight, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with her about how God is with you, and if you would just trust him, he will settle you down, and I'm, I'm giving her scriptures, and then she goes, what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor. She's like, oh, <laughs> and here's the amazing thing. She told me that when she went to church growing up, that everything was, it was like a Pentecostal holiness church, and she said everything was like a sin, uh, everything was a, playing cards was a sin. Fingernail polish was a sin. Makeup was a, was a sin. Basically, the, I guess, and I'm not putting any particular group down, but her particular group, fun was a sin, which is weird to me. Um, so she always, her theology was so bogus that she thought that God just was going, she waited for any moment for God to crush her. And so she expected that because she was walking in sin, that God was just, you know, just for her sake, we're going to crash the plane. I discovered that her theology was off. So I began to tell her about the grace of Christ, about the cross of Christ, about the love of God and how much he loves her and just wants to protect her and watch over her. And, um, you know, she, she wound up falling asleep. And by the end of the conversation, not during my preaching, come on. 
Nobody does that. I know what you're thinking. Um, so she said to me after, she said, you know what? Because of you, I was able to fall asleep. And uh, it, it's amazing. Listen, when we experience the peace of God, when we've, had, when we've overcome anxiety, we can help people who are falling to pieces with anxiety with the peace of God because you are not a thermometer. God has called you to be a thermostat so that wherever you go, you set the environment. And when we truly experience Jesus, not only are we revolutionized, but God uses us to change the environment. It is the coolest thing ever. And none of us can take any credit. None of us can glory in it. We just are, we're just operating, trusting his word. Now, what is it, what is it that you worry about? What, what is it that, what's your trigger toward anxiety? Is it money? Is it, you know, what is it? Because everybody has a trigger, you know. Uh, Jesus said that anxiety or worry will add no value to your life. Nothing. But instead what it does is it's destructive because uh, these attacks can have similar symptoms as heart failure. Sometimes people go in and they think that they're having a heart attack when it's an anxiety attack. It can affect your nervous, your central nervous system, your immune system. Nurses and doctors will know this. Even, even where it triggers respiratory response, cardiovascular changes, ill health, all kinds of things. Even your digestive system can, be, can actually be affected by what we choose to think about what, uh, and by these things that sometimes we allow to happen. So the good news is this. Jesus says, do not worry about anything, what you shall eat, what the clothes on your back. Don't worry about anything, but instead seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, the things that you worry about. In other words, and, and, then, and then he says this. He goes, consider the lilies of the field. How they're clothed even more glorious than Solomon. Your heavenly father watches over them. Your heavenly father knows when even one sparrow falls to the ground. And then he says this. How much more valuable are you? You. Your heavenly father puts more value on you than all of his creation. Because he made you. Because he loves you. And he wants to take care of you. He wants you to know that you can trust him. So what is Jesus doing? He's saying the key to overcoming anxiety, worry, and fear is a love relationship with God, your father. It's beautiful. So he gives us good news. And what does anxiety mean anyways? The biblical terms in the New Testament basically are these Greek words. It's called marimna. And basically it kind of means to be distracted by many other things. Distracted from who? distracted from the peace of the peace of God that otherwise could be yours rather than the anxieties, fears, and worries. You, you, you know, like Martha and Mary. Remember, Jesus came into their home, and what is Martha doing? She's, Jesus said, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Marimna. Many parts and pieces. Fragmentation of thoughts. <laughs> but Jesus is right there. So what is her sister Mary? Martha's ticked off by Mary because what is Mary doing? She's doing the one thing Jesus said that's necessary. She is at his feet taking in all the ministry he can give because she knew that she would fall apart and she would fall to pieces if she didn't have the peace of God. Are you with me? So Mary knew the one thing. Hey, hey, there's just one thing that we need to major in and everything else falls into place. Uh, and, and, and anxiety and peace melt, uh, anxiety and worry melts away. I, I had, we had a great first service. At the end of it, a, an, an older woman came up to me and said, Pastor, you can't believe how perfect that message was for how my life played out. I said, tell me about it. She said for, listen, 15 years, 15 years. She said, my life was filled with anxiety. I was on all kinds of medication. And then, I, when I heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I began to put my faith in Christ. I began to follow Christ. And I let him govern my life. She said, 
the anxiety went away for the first time. And all, and I stopped taking any medication and I began to experience the peace of God for the first time in my life. What I forgot to tell you, amen, come on, bring it on. What I forgot to tell you is this. Because of all the anxiety, she was on the threshold of a divorce and they were about to divorce, but because of her response to the gospel, because of her response by saying yes to following Christ, her marriage came together, and now they've been together for years when they already were about to file the paperwork. You see what Jesus does? You see, we don't preach just to waste time. We preach because we believe in what God will do. Now, I want us to think about, write these things down and borrow a pen, whatever you have to do, get on your uh, phone, but don't go to you, uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Just go right to your notes if you need to take notes on your phone and write these things down. I want you to train, or God wants us to train our minds in four things. Number one, rejoicing. Okay, this is, this is absolutely epic if we can get ourselves into this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, who is writing this? The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians. It's filled with him telling them these imperatives to rejoice. Now, does he have any authority to say such things? This is Paul who's writing to the Philippians. Guess where? Do you know where? Up there in the balconies on the floor. Do you know where he's writing these words? In jail. He's unjustly in jail. And not only that, but even years before that, when he came to Philippi, because he cast a demon out of a slave girl that was being used by her masters to make money on her fortune telling, when the demon was cast out, that demonic gift was taken away, and the owners of the slave girl had Paul and Silas put into prison. But guess what they were doing while they were in chains in prison? They made a choice, and the Bible says, at about midnight, Paul and Silas begin to rejoice and sing hymns in the jail. How many times do you hear that, Mike, uh, Mike Neary, who works at the jail? Uh, just breaking out in worship in the jail cell. So we might ask ourselves, what is my excuse? What is the reason that I give myself that would stop me from rejoicing in the Lord who is glorious, who is worthy of praise, who is almighty, who is merciful, who is full of grace, the God who saves, the God who sent his one and only son? What would inhibit us? Come on now. What would stop us from breaking forth and rejoicing him no matter the circumstances? Rejoice in the Lord. Okay. Nothing should keep us. So the first thing he gives us, the first key, which is absolutely essential, is to worship him. Even Psalm 42 in the Old Testament, the psalmist says, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Speaking to himself. Why so disturbed within me? Then the next thing, three words, hope in God. Who's he preaching to? Who's he preaching to? Himself. And then he goes, For I will yet praise you, my God and my Savior. So in his place of misery, he begins to praise. Now this is the most practical thing that you could do to change the course of direction if you find yourself defaulting toward worry and anxiety. I say this with all the pastoral love that I can because I know it's true. I know it's true. Not only rejoicing, but it's, it's, it's cousin thankfulness. Because Paul says over in verse 6, when you pray, pray with thanksgiving. So it's important that we become thankful. Because we have utter confidence. In, you know, I think whenever we get anxious, we have to ask ourselves uh, this question. Am I trusting in God? Do I really trust God? Now watch this. Watch this. How many of you ever watched Superman when you were a kid? Or still do? Now I'm getting you fired up. Remember, what was the one thing that made him become weak? Can I have the picture? What is this? Kryptonite. That's the one thing that would make him weak. Now, 
Do you know what is kryptonite toward worry and fear and anxiety? You know, what, you know what's kryptonite? Rejoicing and thankfulness. You want to get some kryptonite? Pull that kryptonite. Every time the worry and anxiety comes, you just start rejoicing in God. You start, and this is uh, something Matt Chandler said, which I think is excellent. You just start rejoicing and you start being thankful. Talk about lists. You could go on and on and on. When that, when that uh, anxiety and fear and worry and negativity, come on, negativity? Is that, is that the calling of the people who have been redeemed to be purveyors of negativity? To have the gift of discouragement. Is that what we're called to be? No. If you want to know how to change that direction. Just start thanking God for everything in sight. Do you have more hair than me? Thank God every day. Praise God. Do, are you healthy in some degree? or some, is your, Are you working in some certain things in your life? Uh, just begin to thank God. Do you married to somebody you love? Thank God. Are you single? Thank God for your singleness. Do you drive in a car? Are, do you live in a house? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have clothes? Any of, of you guys eat every day? Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Kryptonite, kryptonite, kryptonite. It weakens the power of, of, uh, of fear and anxiety. I'm telling you, it works. It's absolutely powerful. So years ago, I had this precious married couple who uh, I got a phone call and the wife says, it's done, it's over, I'm done. We can't do this anymore. All we do is fight. And I said, well, would you do one last thing? Would you just come to my office? I, I had to talk to her and then I had to contact the husband. I said, would you just come to my office? And, and before you just end it, let, let's have a talk. Let's just talk and let's, let's see what, what happens. Well, I'll come, but I just think that it's over. So the wife sat over there in my office, and the husband chose a chair about 20 feet away. And I'm doing marriage counseling like this. It was like a tennis match, right? So, uh, and, and so we're talking, and I said, well, I want you to do, I said, if, if I asked you to do something for me, would you promise that you would? And they said, yes. And by the way, that's a great pastoral trick. We just, just get them to commit to saying yes and then the next thing that I said is, I just, want, I just want you to do this authentically. I want you, wife, to think about 10 things that you're thankful for and you love about your husband. You can't leave here until you think about 10 things. And then I said to the husband, uh, I want you to think about 10 things that you're thankful for and you love about your wife. And I want you to mean it. You can't just fake this. Like, this is real. Because I, I know how bad it is and I know how rough it is, but, but just 10 things. So the wife... It was a struggle to start, but she began to think, um, I'm really thankful that, you know, and then, and then it came out, number one. And I, I'm also thankful, and I love this about him, that he, and number two, and now I'm watching the husband. And he, he goes from just a cold stone look, and like it's, a, like it's an over look, to, oh, really? And you can see, like, the tears start coming down his eyes. By the time she gets to number 10, this guy's a mess. In a good mess, a hot mess. Is that what we call it? Hot mess? In a good way? So then he starts, and he gets to one, two, three, all the way to ten, and now she's a hot mess. And the two that you were separated a mile from each other, they quickly came together, and it was like PDA City. My goodness gracious, they were like, all over each other, hugging, crying, loving on each other. And I'm like, you guys need to go home now because... But what happened was, because they pulled out the kryptonite against the fear and the aggravation and the worry and all that, they begin to thank God for each other and rejoice over the beautiful things that they're doing. Their marriage is still together. I'm going to guess eight, nine, ten years later. They're in love with each other. And whenever the problems came, they kept doing the right thing. How many of you know that when we practice the word of God that things change? Anybody know what I'm talking about here? So train. And by the way, real quick, there's a story about J.C. Penney. Anybody know who he is? The store J.C. Penney? Did you know he started in 1898, he started a store called the Golden Rule Store. And he prided himself in low prices. He was super energetic. He wanted to change the world. And he got married in 1910. I'm sorry, he got married uh, somewhere in the early 1900s. In 1910, his wife died. 
And he felt like God deserted him. So then later in 1919, he married again and he began to enjoy some good prosperity. His life was back together. Well, uh, in 1923, his second wife died also. You can just imagine. Now then, he finally married a third time. But in 1929, his wife didn't die, thank God. But in 1929, he was actually worth $40 million dollars. But then the crash came, the great and mighty depression came. He lost everything, including his reputation. He was so bad off, he was so depressed, so filled with anxiety, his, he began to take on all kinds of illnesses. He was so bad that they put him in a place called uh, the, uh, a sanitarium in Battle Creek. This is J.C. Penney, a sanitarium. And now, one day, he, he, really, he, was, he was so close to death he didn't think he was going to make it for the next day. He didn't think he would wake up. So he was so shriveled up. And, and so he wrote his, his wife a goodbye letter. He wrote, wrote, wrote his son a goodbye letter. And then the next morning he woke up. And guess what he heard? They had a chapel service that day in the sanitarium. And he heard a hymn. And it was an old hymn called God Will Take Care of You. And something happened inside of him. He was, he, just before that, he was ready to die. Something happened inside of him. He got up out of his room. He went over to the chapel service, and he began to sing the song, God will take care of you, with all of its verses. And he had a sudden metamorphosis, a transformation took place where all of a sudden hope came and God's peace came. And it was like the dawn of a brand new day that came and settled into his heart. He himself, within days, with his own power and God's help, walked out of that sanitarium. And he decided that he was not going to die. He was, he was going to live and not die. He was going to walk with God, and he became a mighty Christian. He got all of his wealth back, plus some. He started the J.C. Penney Corporation and lived for years and thrived and prospered all the way. He was still thriving in his 90s. Can I tell you something, folks? rejoicing in the Lord always will do something in your spirit, will move you. If you're not used to praising God, if you're not used to turning on worship music, if you're not used to singing, if you're not used to thanking, if you want to see a change, then start getting used to it. Every day, train your mind to be thankful and rejoicing. You got it? First step, train your mind to rejoice and thank always. Second step, thing to train your mind on is to have an attitude that rejects all form of worry and fear. If you don't get there, then you can't advance. Paul says this, be anxious for nothing. No thing. Be anxious for nothing. And so Jesus said, don't worry about anything. Because if you seek a relationship with God, a love relationship, then everything you need will be added to you. And then I love 1 Peter, verse uh, 7. You know what it says there? You ready? Cast all your anxiety upon him. Do you know why? Because he cares for you. Do you know what the word means? It means throw it off of you and on to God. Just throw it off. Just cast it off. Cast your anxiety onto him. So we have to have the mindset to reject anxiety. When I was a little boy, I did not like the dentist. I'm sure he was a great guy. But I hated going to the dentist's office. I mean, no, no, no. You don't understand. I was a case. I, I was terrified. Now, I'm not afraid of a lot of things. I used to climb up roofs. I used to paint big buildings on staging up to seven stories high on cherry pickers. You know, I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but I was afraid of the dentist. Now, what's not to love with a dentist? I mean, you've got drilling, you've got drooling, you've got a droopy face, you've got blood, you've got suction, you've got needles, you've got jackhammers going inside of your jaw. What's not to love? You know, I was telling this story to my friend Lisa Neary. And she goes, I just loved the dentist when I was a little girl. I mean, you don't talk like that, but it's like, a, you know. Um, I loved the dentist. In fact, I couldn't wait to say, Mom, can I go to the dentist? She loved the dentist. 
That's not normal, Lisa. I hated the dentist. So much so that my, and I am not exaggerating, when my mom told me I was going to the dentist, I literally broke out in hives all over my hands. My, my hands would have hundreds of hives, both, both this side of my hand, just knowing I was going to the dentist. You see how this stuff can manifest? Now, how many of you know, Neil, at some point, like you have to get over this, right? How many of you know you have to do that? Well, finally, in my 20s, I heard about this Dr. Peterson who was like a, did gentle dentistry. I guess I was used to the demented dentistry. I don't know what I was, but gentle dentistry. I'm like, that sounds real good to me. Real good to me. So anyways, I just said, you know what? It's time. You're not going to have any teeth left in your head. You're going to look like a whatever. You're going to look like anyways. Um, and I decided I'm going to face my fears. Now, let me tell you something. Change isn't change until it's changed, and it was time for me to face the fear of the dentist. I began to pray for the dentist. I began to go. Begin to go. In fact, my second dentist after him, I said, Lord, I want to go in there. I want to tell him about the gospel in a normal way without being weird. I want to be a witness for him. So I started to pray for his salvation. So for me, it became an evangelistic mission, and that helped me to overcome my fear of people putting jackhammers in my teeth and horrible drills. And you know what, I overcame. And, and you know what, I decided that there's no way I'm gonna let this fear rule my life. And I'm here to tell you something. You don't have to let some kind of a trigger or anxiety to cause the same response anymore. You can look at it in the face, you can go there knowing that Lord is with you, and you can face your fears and confront your fears with the help and the power, and you know, mostly, the love of God. He's with you. You're his daughter. You're his son. He doesn't want, not want you to fear anything, and he can give you the strength to finally overcome, just like that woman after 15 years. Reject it. Reject it. You know how you reject it? Because here's the thing. Anxiety comes when your heart speaks to you. When you let your heart just fill you with all kinds of fears, all kinds of crazy scenarios. You know, how many of you are like worst case scenario thinkers? Man, that's great for survivalists, but it's not a good way to live. Like thinking like, like the worst case scenario is always going to happen. But what, what it is, is if you, anxiety comes when your heart speaks to you. But peace comes when you speak to your heart. That's good. When you determine that no longer are your fears, your worries, your anxiety going to have authority in your mind. Because your mind's neutral. It can either go with the things of God or the things of the flesh. So you say then, I refuse to be governed by my sinful nature, which always leads to fear and all these things. Instead... I'm going to let Christ's authority and the word of God that brings comfort, grace, encouragement, that's going to, and strength, I'm going to let that govern my thoughts. So now I'm going to speak to my heart, just like the psalmist. He said, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you thinking this way? Why are you so disturbed within? Put your hope in God and begin praising him. And that's how the psalmist was able to overcome and how you can overcome to reject. The third one is requests. So now we request, but in everything, instead of anxiety, in everything. Everybody say everything. Say everything again. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made to God. You know what supplication means? That's help me prayers. Those are your basic, God, help me. It could be three words. Or it could be, God, I'm afraid. I'm asking for your help. I'm going to you right now. I'm casting all my care. Here's what I'm worried about, God. Worry at God. Here's the cool thing about prayer and thanksgiving. Prayer is basically, there. prayer and worry are very similar. Did you hear that? Prayer and worry are very similar. What you're doing is you're rehearsing your circumstances. Right? But the difference is, worry does not have a connection. There's no relational connection. When you worry, you just worry into thin air. That's why Jesus said it won't, do, it won't help you. 
But when you pray, but you rehearse your circumstances, you're praying. You're doing the same thing, only you have now a relational receiver. I think it was Matt Chandler that said that. I like that. Prayer gives you a relational receiver. So now, when you rehearse your circumstances, you are converting that in a relationship with your heavenly Father that loves you. And let me tell you something. God absolutely loves it when his children come to him with our needs. He loves it. I love it when little Toby, my grandson, or little Oliver, they're little six-month babies. They're my grandsons. I love it when when they cry and they put their arms up or they want me to come. I love to come over and swoop in and rescue them. And then I hand them to Gail when they need a diaper change. (laughs) Or I'll give them a bottle. I do that, don't I, Gail? And I just love it. Because do you think God is any different? His kids are coming to him. Some of you need to know this. This will be the most therapeutic thing you've ever heard in your life. God, your daddy, you're his child. Anything that robbed you from that relationship is from the pit of hell. You may have had the worst dad in the world, and your picture and imagery of what a father is has been so skewered that it's so hard to get through the cloud of what your image of what a true father is. But the Bible tells us that Jesus came to reconcile us in a relationship with a father in heaven that loves us. You want to be healed? You want to be healed of, a, of the father wound? You go to your father who is in heaven. Hallowed be his name. And he wants his kingdom to come in your life and his will, not yours, to be done as it is in heaven in your life. He wants to give you today your daily, meet your daily needs. And he wants you to know that he forgives you of every sin. Therefore, you are empowered to forgive even a father that was so unloving or so abusive or so hurtful in some way. The power to know you're forgiven gives you the power to forgive. And once you forgive, you're able to be set free from what the enemy does. Lead us not into temptation. Lord, deliver me from the evil one. And where the evil one loves to live is in, a, is in a mind that just cannot forgive because of all the trauma. But the beautiful thing about that prayer is it brings us into a relationship with a heavenly father that completely restores your soul because of the damage done by somebody else in your life. Isn't that beautiful? I call him dad when I pray. Sounds weird. I don't care. I really don't care what anybody thinks. I talk to my God reverentially as a dad. Because you know why? I need a dad. I had a good dad. But he couldn't measure up to this dad up here. This this dad loves me unconditionally. This dad knew how to, to straighten me out. He knew how to heal my soul. He's a good dad. So what do we need to do lastly? We need to redirect our thinking. We read it already. If you got a list that you default to that comes to negativity, just just drives negativity into your mind or fear. (laughs) Please know this. You don't have to continue down a path that makes you continually filled with anxiety. You can change. You can change. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, what's right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. Think about those things. List them down. You know what you got to, what I had to do? I had to write lists of scriptures. Man, you got to get radical. You want change? You got to get radical. If, some, if there's a scripture or a promise, and you should dig for them, look for them. Look at it, go, go to Google. What scriptures will help me with anxiety? What scriptures will help me with worry? What scriptures will help me with it? Find the ones that speak to your soul. Not just the list they give you. Find the ones. Print them out. Stick them on your wall. Put them on your mirror. Put them in your car. Quote them, speak them, because it's time to reverse it. And you can be like this woman. Her name is Alam 
Afeso. I met Alam Afeso on a plane as I was heading toward India. Our first stop was Boston to Frankfurt, Germany. And I met this woman on the plane. I don't know why God uses me this way, but she was from Africa. She was returning home from seeing her daughter, who I believe was going to school in Boston. She had her Bible. It was an Ethiopian Bible, and she was clutching it almost like it was a charm, holding the Bible. What she was doing is she was shaking, literally shaking. And she began to tell me her story. I go, why are you so afraid? She said, because I flew from Africa to Boston a year ago, and I was so terrified about the flight that I've never been back to see my husband in a year because I was afraid to get back on a plane again. And I'm like, okay, Lord, here's another one. You got me sitting here. And I said, what's that? Is that a Bible? Because it was written in, uh, I think it was the Ethiopian language. She goes, yes. I said, let's just do a few things while I sit with you. Would you open in your Bible to one, Psalm 139 and you tell me in English what it says. She quoted scripture. Would you go to Isaiah 26? Tell me what that says. And she began to quote scripture. Would you please go to Matthew chapter 6? What, what is Jesus saying to your heart right there? Do not worry. How, how about Philippians chapter 4? And we had a Bible study on the plane. I said, you know what? God loves you. He, he, he's not like some God that's looking forward to crashing the plane so he can just end your life in some way that you expect. He's a loving God, a God of grace, a God of kindness, a God of mercy. He wants to take away the fear right now. Right then, the peace of God came in. You know why? Because the word of God works. Peace of God came in. So I had to leave in Frankfurt to go to India. She went from Frankfurt to go to Africa. I get an email from her. I gave her a card. She, she had come back to Boston and she said, I don't, I'm not afraid to travel anymore. Thank you so much for what you did in your prayer for me on the plane. I would like to come to your church on Sunday. Some Sunday, I said, you come to my church on some, day, some Sunday and uh, um, you bring her daughter. She's going to bring her daughter. So she came to church on a Sunday because of what Jesus had done. And when she came to find me, I wasn't there because I was gone that Sunday. But you know what? It doesn't matter because God's the one that she needs to give all glory and praise to. We're just the instruments. How many of you would like to have Jesus revolutionize your life right now. I'm gonna ask a simple prayer request right now. Maybe you've never received Jesus before. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. And I wonder today if you never came to Jesus, especially in this way, particular way, to get rest from your weariness, the baggage that you claim. I'm gonna say a prayer, and if it's, if it's uh, the first time you prayed this prayer, just put up your hand. We'll make sure we get resources to you. Let's say it right out loud. And, and then the rest of the church, if you're already saved, just say it along with them. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm a warrior. But I trust that you intervened in my life. And I want you in my life today. Forgive me for my sins. Wipe my slate clean. I believe you died on a cross. And I believe you rose again. And I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe that you will change my life from this day forward. I begin to, to walk with you today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now if you prayed that prayer for the first time. I want you to boldly. Put your hand up just to declare that I'm now walking with Jesus. I see your hand. Put your hand up. If that's you up in the balconies, I see your hand. I see your hand. Praise God. Is there anybody else that you're saying for the first time? Thank you, Jesus. I see your hand. Yes. Amen. So good up there in the balcony. So good up there in the balcony in this region. Keep your hand up until an usher would get you resources. Praise God for that. And I just want to say a pastoral prayer. We're going to close with worship. Father, for those who already are Christians, I pray, God, that this would be a day that they would come out of the darkness of, 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 of anxiety and fear and worry, and they would come into the light of trusting you. After all, 
you're trustworthy. Lord, all, all across this congregation, do miracles in Jesus' name. Do you receive that this morning? Amen. God bless you. We're going to have, if I could have uh, the prayer team come, pastors, wives, elders and their wives, or anybody that's on the prayer team, please stand right across here like this. And uh, if you're during the song, if you'd like prayer, just come up and worship. God bless you for those that you have to leave. Have an awesome day, but enjoy this worship as we sing.